Good. Well, uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, as do a lot of you know, we uh, have regularly been doing these uh, webinars talking about different technologies and different applications. And I guess those of you who've been around, there's no, I'm certainly not been shy about doing ones about JP3 and the near infrared technology that they uh, that they bring to play and how we've used it in a variety of applications. A lot of you have seen talks about, you know, kind of the gas plant side of things, about condensate stabilizers and applications like that. And we certainly talked about some crude oil blending applications. Um, but we recently just finished doing our first diluted bitumen application. And, uh, you know, to be blunt, we actually kind of even impressed ourselves with how smoothly it went. And so I want to talk a little bit about today about that application about the near infrared technology itself, um, and then how we you know applied it in that application and what kind of analytical results we saw. Um, as I mentioned, I'm not doing this from my usual setup. So if I look like I'm running into technical difficulties as I'm doing this, it's probably because I am. Um, so as per usual, I apologize to those of you who come to a lot of these. You know, I usually talk a little bit, a couple slides about who Insight, Insight Analytical is. And then I'm going to talk, uh, I think, because we have a few new people here, certainly I'm going to talk a little bit about how near infrared spectroscopy works and what's kind of unique about JP3's implementation of it. And then kind of walk you through the process that we went through in the last sort of four or five months of this year going from proven or getting some data in the lab that suggests that we think we can actually do this measurement to implementing it out in the field in pretty short order and getting some you know some impressive results so inside analytical calgary-based systems integrator and distributor run of a fairly big shop in the northeast of calgary we got about twenty thousand square feet accessible to us Nine day, nine day doors, say that fast. Uh, 10 ton overhead crane, we can pull a full analyzer building in off the crane and straight into the building, fabricate and get her back out the doors. AB3, AB83 compliant fabrication, we've done CRNs for Alberta, BC, Ontario, Saskatchewan. A lot of the folks that are here at Insight, I've worked with other companies in the past and I kind of you know, to some extent, been handpicking a bit of team of people who bring an excellent skill set. Um, so everything from you know strong documentation backgrounds, we have a great uh, drafts, drafting team, document control. So it puts us in good stead to work with some of the bigger engineering companies. You know, in fact, we took on our our first major project. We took on was uh, you know shortly after starting up the company it was with Floor. And any of you who've worked with big engineering companies knows these guys can really drive you on dots. And we actually got praise on the quality of documentation we, we provided. Um, sorry, I'm the one guy who should be shutting off his phone, I guess, eh? Um, journeyman electrician on staff, you know, everything we do, of course, CSA inspected, um, full instrumentation and field support team. Um, so, you know, we do uh, service out of Grand Prairie, out of Edmonton, out of Calgary, do full factory acceptance tests right here in Calgary. We like doing systems integration projects. You know, I had a past history of running a systems integration uh, group for Amatech, and uh, we've got a full set of capabilities to do that here. Everything from custom sample systems to uh, process analyzer integration, PLC and automation uh, to full analyzer buildings. I guess for me, you're kind of on here a little bit earlier as I was talking to some of my colleagues, you know, I'm, I teach sample system courses all over the world. I'm over in Holland doing one now for this week. And again, next week, and then one in France, and one in Chicago later this year, we get analyzer sample systems. We understand where the problems are and we have a pretty good grasp on how to build ones that work. Oops. Oh, 
but I'm supposed to animate its way in. Anyways, like I said, some technical issues with uh, not using my usual gear. Um, we'll do everything from front end engineering design. We've done feed projects for refiners, for fertilizer producers. We'll take that feed and go into detail engineering. Again, we will only do this for analyzer stuff. We don't do pressure vessels and things like that. If it's analytical, we'd love to work on it. So we'll go from front end engineering to detail design, fabrication, install and commissioning, and service is a big thing for us. That's why it gets the biggest icon. We have a great service team. Everything we put in the field, we make sure we can service and support our customers. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the technology side and this using absorbent spectroscopy and near infrared spectroscopy to measure things. And so we, you know, we see this get used a lot in applications like ultraviolet absorption spectroscopy for gas phase samples. Um, we use absorption spectroscopy to determine colors of liquids. It's a pretty common technique. And what we're gonna talk about using it is doing it using or doing is using it in the near infrared to identify and quantify hydrocarbons or the physical properties of hydrocarbons. I usually find it useful though to talk about, you know, why we look at absorption rather than, trans rather than transmission. And the analogy I like to use or the example I, I like to use is if we're trying to measure the color of something. If I was to shine a white flashlight at a sample, just because it transmits green light, I can't tell what color it is. A clear piece of plastic would transmit green, green light, and so would a green piece of plastic. How I can tell it is green is by the fact that green object takes away a lot of the blue or it absorbs a lot of the blue. So you see there's not much blue light getting through and there's not much red light getting through. And so the fact that it takes away the red and the blue and transmits the green is what lets us identify it as actually being a green object. So absorption spectroscopy looks at the light that gets attenuated or the light that gets taken away. And from that makes interpretations about what chemicals are present or what physical properties the object that is being exposed that light has. So the first thing when we talk about using light to measure crude oil, and certainly when we talk about saying I'm going to use light to measure something in diluted bitumen, as people go on, oh, that sounds kind of ridiculous because the stuff is jet black. And so in fact, when we put a hydrocarbon sample in front of visible light, what we'll see is that the hydrocarbon does absorb really strongly down there in that visible region. It will attenuate most or all of the visible light that comes in with the sample. And so you can't do anything in looking at some of these heavy, heavier crudes um, using visible light. But as we move out into the towards beyond the red and into what we refer to as the near infrared, those samples actually start to transmit light again. And we're able to get at least with you know what we knew before this doing the set of tests with on the dill bit, we knew that with crudes, we could get light through the crude oil and make a good analytical measurement. And in fact, as we go through, the oils tend to get more and more transmissive. There's a couple little absorption bands there. And then we get to around 1600 nanometers in the near infrared. And we start to see all these absorption bands over here. And that piece of spectral information gives us information about what hydrocarbons are there and by correlation also what physical properties those hydrocarbons may have. And so each of the different hydrocarbons will absorb this infrared light slightly differently. And we can use that to identify what hydrocarbons are there. And by looking at how much light absorbs, we can quantify how much of those hydrocarbons are there. And so this has been around for a long time. A guy named Koblenz, physical chemist around 1900, 
built this great big spectrometer that took up an entire room and started looking at the infrared spectra of hydrocarbons and, and came to the conclusion, which was you know, long has long been proven to be true, that each of the hydrocarbons has a different infrared spectra. As the structure of the molecule changes, it changes how those molecules interact with light. And so we've known that infrared spectroscopy can be used to make measurements of hydrocarbons for a long time. It started to get used in the 1950s. Um, you know, Hartman and Braun really pushed it. This even used somewhat during World War II. Hartman and Braun was pushing this really into industrial applications in the yeah. 40s and 50s. And so, you know, it was one of the things that's very good at is, to, for example, determining how much water there is in a hydrocarbon, like acetic acid. Um, when we got into the 1980s, fiber optics started to be available. And uh, companies like Bowman, who's now been purchased by ABP, started to build near-infrared spectrometers or Fourier transforming uh, spectrometers. Moving parts, moving mirrors, but it allowed them to get more and more high resolution data and take this into additional process applications. And these still get used a lot today. You'll see a lot of FTNIR systems in at refineries. Um, and they're great analyzers. The issue is, or the potential issue is, from our perspective, the issue is, um, they usually require a lot of maintenance. They've got moving parts. They require a whole bunch of things that so they really stay really well aligned. And when you put them in a refinery, you've got usually got a large maintenance team there that can take care of them. It's a lot different though, when we start saying, well, but I, what I would like to do is take this infrared technology, take the, the things that this infrared technology can, can do and move it out to a crude oil blending skid up in uh, Fox Creek. No analyzer guys around to take care of it. Probably nobody there to do any kind of maintenance. They're gonna look for it running 24 seven. And we wanna be able to take this and put it out in the field get it up and running and have people convinced and experiencing that these things can work for a long time with very little or no maintenance. And so to do that, one of the things that required was a lot better way to do the spectroscopy. Had to get away from the moving parts, had to be able to get really high resolution, get lots of details in that spectrum. Had to be able to get lots of light through the sample and so that's one of the things that has been, JP3 has brought out with the technology that's, that's being used today. JP3 employs a tunable laser spectrometer. So the fact that it's laser, that lasers are very bright light sources. They can push a lot of light through the sample. And so when we start, start talking about samples like bitumen, where there can be a lot of, uh, uh, asphaltines and heavy uh, hydrocarbons that would normally absorb or scatter a lot of light. We have microcarbon residue that scatters a lot of light. Um, the fact that we have a really bright light source helps a lot to push this laser light through the sample. The spectrometer is also built around some of the telecommunications technology that has been developed for the communications industry and required really long time, mean time between failures, very high reliability and very great reproducibility. One of the things that's been really difficult to do with some of the older infrared technologies has been to say, well, I could build two or three spectrometers or 10 spectrometers that all operate virtually exactly the same way. I could move the calibrations from one spectrometer to the next and have it work. Diff has been difficult to do historically. It's something that we can prove, have proven that we can do very reliable with the JP3 spectrometers because they have tremendous wavelength repeatability. If you can get that X axis, the wavelength axis the same between all these spectrometers, it enables you to reuse models 
or push models from one spectrometer onto another spectrometer. So what kind of things do we see? When we look at the different hydrocarbons in near infrared, they all end up having bands around here. The top spectrum right now is an NGL sample at 420 pounds. The lower one is a propane sample. If everything works, the slide's animated, it's gonna change. Now you can see what N-butane looks like versus propane, and now N-butane versus isobutane. So each of the different hydrocarbons has a different profile, if you like, in the near infrared. If we were just looking for individual species, we could probably look at these spectra and pick them out by eye with a little bit of training. The thing that makes it complicated though, is when we get a complex mixture together. By the way, I usually start these things off. If there's any questions along the way, um, please feel free to just jump in and interrupt me um, or put them in the chat and Jess or Scotty will certainly interrupt me. Um, so the thing that makes life more difficult is when we have a, a mixture of different hydrocarbons. Then the changes in the spectral shape are more difficult to see by eye. But we can use pattern recognition and software techniques to try to pull and extract data out of the small subtle changes in shape that, you know, that are virtually not able to be seen with the naked eye, but Algorithm-wise, mathematically, we can pull that information out. So we employ a technique that's you know, been referred to in the, uh, in the sciences as chemometrics. Got driven a lot by a guy named Svant Wold, um, whose father was an econometrician. And so when Svant started applying some of the same mathematical techniques to chemistry, he took econometrics and said, well, let's make chemometrics. It's been around again for decades, but we can do it a lot better now. We've had massive advances in computing speed, which lets us crunch a lot more numbers. And one of the things that JP3 does is get this very high resolution data, lots of data points in the spectrum. So there's a lot of numbers to be crunched in order to take that spectral data use these mathematical algorithms and have it generate useful information for operating a plant. We've also seen huge changes in sort of the conventional technologies we, we take for granted now. You know, our phones recognize our images, they recognize our fingerprints. You know, in the 80s when I was in university, um, comp sci profs were saying that we don't know whether computers will ever really be able to fully interpret human speech. Well, kids' toys do it now. Um, we use speech to text. As a matter of fact, I've used, because I teach these courses internationally, even in PowerPoint, I can put on a feature where it simultaneously, as I talk, is translating it to another language and writing the text down before, below the slides. It's amazing what we do right now. Um, so we've taken this ability to detect and determine patterns, whether it's audio waveforms, whether it's pictures, and convert that into actionable data. So we take that same capability. We apply that ability to analyze these complex patterns that we see in the spectrum to chemistry applications. And we use that spectral data to determine things like chemical composition, and physical properties. So for those of you who've been through some of my talks before, I've talked a lot about doing chemical composition. We've employed this technology to do um, DMC4 analysis on condensate, to do C1 through C6 or C1 through C9 analysis on natural gas liquids. You know, when we start talking about things like diluted bitumen, what we start being interested in is being able to do more on this physical property side. And vapor pressure has always been a big thing for us. We've done vapor pressure in crudes for a while. It's the bitumen part, the dark, uh, dirty bitumen, you know, the, the opaque bitumen, that really was a question as to whether we could get this all to work. 
in the application. So we talked about better spectrometers and better ways to process data. But the other thing is, is that when we put process analyzers in, often the issue we have to deal with is, can we get a good sample to the analyzer? And you know, a lot of our conventional analyzers that we use, whether it's gas chromatographs or online vapor pressure analyzers, uh, are built around lab analyzers. And they're built around small tubing. You look at a GC and you see things like this eighth inch and 16th inch tubing. And you think, well, that may work great from how the analyzer works. But when I've got a sample that has tars and asphaltines and microcarbon residue and waxes, we can have a lot of difficulty getting those kind of samples into and through an analyzer. And it's one of the reasons that we say that, you know, a large percentage of the problems that happen with analyzer installations is about trying to get a good sample to the analyzer. If we want to make a sample system robust when we're dealing with something like waxy condensates or dirty crudes, we want to minimize all the filtering, all the regulators, valves, small tubing, anything that can plug or get uh, contaminated by these materials, we want to minimize the use of that. We want to try to reduce all the maintenance requirements so those become all of our high maintenance devices. We'd like to make the system as, if we're going to put it up at some place like Fox Creek or you know someplace more remote, we want to keep everything simple so that uh, the system is relatively easy and maintainable if there needs maintenance. And we like to move the solution as close to the process as we can. Because the other thing spectroscopy allows us to do is get much faster response speeds than some of the conventional techniques. So for example, with the near infrared analyzer, you know, we can do a full analysis of a condensate in 30 seconds or faster. We can do a full vapor pressure analysis in 30 seconds or faster. And we can combine all those measurements into one device. So we have units up in Northern BC, they're on a condi or doing a full C1 through C12 analysis and vapor pressure in near real time. One of the things that really helps on the sampling side of things is to have bigger flow paths. So when we think about conventional analyzers, we'll see things like I say, eighth inch and 16th inch tubing. In the JP3 flow cells, we have large flow paths. So these are half inch NPT ports. So we can put half inch tubing onto there. It flows through a flow cell that is basically built into a complete 316L stainless steel block. Um, CRN to 1500 PSI. So this whole system has been built so it can mount on a 600 pound ANSI class system and run at full pressures. One of the things we don't want to do when we're trying to sample liquids is change the pressures. If we lower the pressure, we're going to make it more likely that the liquid's going to bubble. So we want to have a system that can run at full line pressure and operating temperatures at a plant. So we want all our materials and construction compatible with that. So when we look at the JP3 flow cell, completely manufactured of stainless steel, inside the flow cell itself, we have these two sapphire rods. The synthetic sapphire, sapphire has some great properties for us. Transmits infrared light really well. So we can get our beam of light to go through it. It's the second hardest thing next to diamond. So the windows don't get scratched. Sand, clay, bitumen, asphaltines, they don't scratch or damage the surface. Very chemically unreactive. Salts, H2S, don't attack the surface. So inside the cell, we have these two sapphire rods. We take a beam of light from that fancy spectrometer with its custom scannable laser light source, shoot it through our sample that's flowing between the two sapphire rods, pick it up on another collimator and send it back on a fiber back to the analyzer. 
So what we want to do is put this out as close to the measurement point as we can. So we can look at an installation as being something like this. Rather than taking the sample and moving it all the way over to an analyzer building and having pressure drop along the way and sample transport lines of plug and all of the issues that that can create, we take that flow zone, we mount it out as close to the process pipe as we can. We use some source of differential pressure. Maybe it's an orifice plate, Maybe it's a process pump. It could even just be a number of pipe elbows. Something that creates enough differential pressure that we can sample from the high pressure side of that DP and through that half inch tubing, return it back into the process. And this allows the sample to flow through the flow cell and lets us make a measurement of that flowing sample. So we have that flow cell mounted out close to the process, I'm trying to show the path of the fluid flow going through this. And we take the part that has a spectrometer and that all the computational power to interpret that spectrometer. So if you like the brain, if you like, and we mount it someplace else. We don't have to build a custom analyzer building now. We put this over in an MCC building a control room, the blending uh, room at a, at a blending skit. And we connect it via fiber optic over to that flow cell. So we mount that thing remotely. We take a beam of light out to the fiber optic, pass it through the flow cell, bring it back to the brain for analysis. So we send this up fiber out. It goes through the sample. We look at what wavelengths get absorbed. Absorb. That's what really interrogates the sample to find out what's there. So we get to measure this absorption spectrum or how much light was attenuated and taken away. We run it through those sophisticated algorithms and we can use that to determine chemical composition and or physical properties all based on that absorption spectrum that's come back. We can do this in the gas phase and we can do it in the liquid phase. The units are configured so that they can support, uh, there's three common configurations, either one measurement cell, four measurement cells, or up to eight measurement cells. And so, you know, if you're a small blending operation, that one measurement cell approach is probably what you're looking for. Cause you say, I got one stream going out and I wanna know the vapor pressure in it. You're a larger operation, you might say, well, I wanna look at my blended stream, but I also wanna look at the quality of the products that are coming in, both maybe my diluent, my butane, or my crude that's coming in and look at the blended stream going out. Big gas plant, multiple fractionation towers, you know, possibly look at an eight measurement point system. So installations now become fairly simple. We have a sample supply point, flows out, flows through that flow cell, returns back to a return point. In around the flow cell, we build a bit of infrastructure, certainly for Canada. In the US, they often put this outside. Here, we'll usually put it inside of a heated enclosure. We'll incorporate things like a flow switch so we know that it's flowing temperature and pressure transmitters so we can get signals back to say, is our process fluid look like it's an appropriate temperature for what we expect it to be? You know, add things like a pressure safety valve if somebody locks the flow in. So if we have some thermal expansion, lab grab sample points, et cetera. Bring the diagnostic information, the digital or analog information back over to the analyzer and have two fibers that go out, a send beam, and a return beam bringing, bringing information back to the spectrometer. So you take what that PNID looks like, and here's a simple implementation. This is a, one of the first installations we did back in 2016, 2017, out in Southern uh, Saskatchewan, a little crude oil blending skid. So on that PNID, I talked about the flow switch, we have 
pressure over here and temperature over here. We have sample coming out, sample returning back. Oh, Mark, I wish I could do water cut at those sorts of levels, but no. Um, not at this time, at least. Water cut's a little bit tough in the near infrared just because water has a really broad, mushy spectrum. Um, certainly, I mean, there's you know some other more conventional technologies around for that one. Um, even in Dilbit, especially, yeah, Dilbit's a nasty one for doing water cut too. So no, unfortunately, we can't. Um, so we have a sample that comes through. You can see isolation valves flows up through the infrared flow cell, returns back. You can see the fibers sitting in on this thing right over here. Let's give you a little picture, a little bit better. Zoom with that whole system. Oops, I thought I could do that. So, you know, there's what a, a typical installation might look like. Pretty simple. Again, as you look at it, there's no filters, no moving parts in there, no regulators. Um, we have a flow cell flowing in and back. I know Mr. Philpott's going to beat me up over this again and say, I was using a ball valve up there to throttle the flow. Um, you know, usually now we put a needle valve up there uh, um, um, just in case we want to keep some of that back pressure and control flow rates down. So again, this is on a crude oil blending skid, real-time vapor pressure, virtually no sample system to speak of, no fluid recovery system. We return everything back to process and we're generating real-time actionable data. This unit has been up on a conventional crude, light, you know, fairly light crude um, four or five years now. Virtually no maintenance over that period of time. We've gone a couple of times to clean cell windows and that's about it really. So we've had some of the people um, that market to these kinds of uh, applications say, you know, the JP3 really struggles on heavier crudes or darker crudes. And it's completely an unwarranted statement. We've been on crude oil applications for five years now. And this is some data um, for both a, a pipeline where they were doing multiple different products. They'd have light sweet that they would sometimes blend in heavy sour so that they could try to get to a sulfur spec. They'd blend in butane to get to the vapor pressure spec and the products changed all the time. And the, the graph there is about over 200 data pairs. And what we did is we compared the online vapor pressure from both a conventional RVP type analyzer, so we'll change my pen, pen color. So, you know, in this case, it was an orb. So we had an online orb there to do vapor pressure analysis. We had the JP3 there to do vapor, vapor pressure analysis by near infrared spectroscopy. And what we've done is we've drawn each of the data points to show that there's some error in them, that, you know, they might be plus or minus one KPA. When you plot these two data sets, and we compared this all to a lab grabner, that you're know, pulling lab grab samples and said, whenever we pull a grab sample, we're gonna look at what the two online analyzers are reading and make a comparison of the results. And we've overlaid the two data sets and there's very little differences between them. If we go back and look at the historical data, the orb might've agreed to the, with the lab to within 2.2 KPA, the JP3 and IR was agreeing within 2.7 KPA. The big difference was the online vapor pressure analyzer, the online conventional vapor pressure analyzer was getting calibrated regularly, was getting maintenance done on the seals in the moving piston that's in the vapor pressure analyzer. Whereas the JP3 basically ran with no maintenance and no additional calibrations. And so that's one of the big differences is that there's a, there are technologies we can do this, but it's the question is, is do you have the people that can support them? And when you're looking at applications like this, well, the other big difference is, you know, uh, this guy, 
uh, maybe you're lucky if you get a six minute update. This guy, we're getting a 30 second update. So if we're trying to do real time blending controls, that speed of response helps a lot. If we look at sample system response, we can actually be more like 15 minutes on some of the conventional analyzers where we get almost instantaneous response with this technology. So now let's talk about bitch. So we had a client come to us and they wanted to do vapor pressure and diluted bitumen. And they wanted to know if we could do it with an infrared analyzer. And we really weren't sure. So we said, well, the first issue we've got to deal with is figure out is, can we get enough light? Can we get signal through this bitumen sample? So they sent us lab samples. We told them we won't be able to build a model based off of a few lab samples. We're not going to be able to tell you that how accurate we can do vapor pressure. But we will, we will be able to tell you is, can we get enough light to the sample that we can get a good signal? And we'll be able to tell you if the spectra looks like other spectra that we've seen. So you can see why I like online analyzers, because my lab work doesn't necessarily end up looking that clean. But um, you know, we ran some of these samples in the lab. So you see the JP3 infrared cell sitting up here, all the stuff sitting in a few mud. And we were basically just injecting some of these samples of bitumen and seeing what kind of spectra we got. And we got a spectra that you can see up top here. And if you think back to some of the spectra I showed earlier, you know, it's similar to those spectral shapes we were looking at earlier. The big thing that we see with bitumen is these big offsets off a of baseline. We run a condensate, baseline's right around zero. Here, because of all small particulate, microcarbon residue, the asphaltines in, that are in there, the polyaromatic hydrocarbons, we get these big baseline offsets. But it's within the range that we've seen in other applications and we felt we could work with. So we went back to the customer and told them we could, you know, this looks pretty doable. This is in March, April of this year. So we finished lab tests around April and we gave the customer a set of performance specs around May. You know, there was talk about purchasing it. We said, okay, we want everybody clear. This is a new application for us. What we're gonna tell you is that you're gonna to have to give us some number of months to pull enough lab samples and to try to model this data so we can try to get close enough to the accuracy and performance that you want on the vapor pressure. So these guys wanted to do, you know, they're blending bitumen to the pipeline specs, which involve blending to both a vapor pressure and viscosity number. And so we gave them, a, you know, a set of performance specs and we said, give us six months and we should be able to hit these kinds of specs. And then maybe give us another six months and we'll pull it in even tighter. The customer was great and agreed to give us purchase order in May. So I want to give you an idea of how fast we can ex execute a project like this. We got a purchase order on May 25th, had drawings out for review by June 13th, did all the procurement. JP3 can turn these analyzers quick. So we had to procure all the things for that, that flow conditioning panel. We had as built out to these guys by August 17th, delivered the analyzer on site in Fort Saskatchewan by August 18th, had our install done by August 20th, sent a mobile lab out there, did real time, you know, pulling samples, getting vapor pressure samples to build a model and had a working model to measure vapor pressure and dilute a bitumen by September 2nd. This gives you an idea. So, you know, if you go back, actually, you know, you can see we actually went out there before we were going to do the install and started looking at, well, do you have any space we can actually put the analyzer into this building? And so we had identified a spot where we said we can put our flow panel over there. We'll mount the analyzer a bit more remotely from that fiber optic over the flow panel. And so, you know, 
that was the system probably in May, June. And by uh, August, we have flow panel mounted up on the wall. If you think back to that picture of the one I showed, you know, that was installed in 2016, these systems, we haven't had to make an awful lot of changes. We, again, we have flow coming in near the bottom. The yellow is a flow switch. The JP3 flow cell is sitting in the middle of those two white boxes. They're just a protection point to protect the fibers that's coupled to the cell. Above it is an RTD off to the right on the screen. Yeah, the right, I think as you're looking at your screen, it is a pressure transmitter. So we have our temperature pressure. We have a little piece of technology we add in above there just to be able to stop the flow and get better spectral measurements and junction box it in there. So that whole thing is sitting on a panel that's about one meter by one meter, mounted on the wall of the shelter that they had in their blending building. The analyzer is mounted remotely from there. You can see power and fibers coming in at the bottom of the analyzer. And on the front of the analyzer, we've got a little color touch screen where we can program in all the necessary user interface requirements, give them their vapor pressure numbers, what their process pressure and temperature are, how much light's being transmitted through the system, et cetera. So again, we have all, we turned this whole system around in, you know, two, three months-ish. Operationally, we were just out there recently. So we took apart the flow cell and looked in the flow cell and it sure looks like it's bitumen in there. You look at it, it is jet black. You take the windows out and they're covered with this black, dirty looking oil. But we're getting enough light through the samples, we can do the measurements. So we did our drying install was complete in two days. By that mean, we got all the Modbus communications, data communications done, initial lab results in the first five days, first model in with five days. The data we got in the first five days exceeded our proposed six month specification. Actually, it exceeded our one year specification. I'm gonna show you what that data looks like in a minute. We went out and pulled some more samples, enhanced that model within about a next another couple of weeks. And it's been out there and running since zero downtime, continuously generating the vapor pressure number. We're doing updates every minute on this device. So here's what our data look like, or some of the data look like. A continuous VPCR4 measurement, one minute updates being compared to ASTM D6377, we have a one-to-one -one plot over here. By measured at the bottom, we mean lab. By predicted on the side, we mean the JP3. And so you can see you know, the strong physical correlation between the results, a one-to-one -one mapping of the lab results onto the JP3 results. We show a number of gray circles on here. Those are our samples that were pulled during the initial set of runs out there to, to be used to build a model. So the model is used to further predict uh, vapor pressure data. The red diamonds that are on here are samples that were taken later that were used to test to see how well the model was doing. So the important thing to note here is that the model, the red diamonds, the, the test samples correspond really well to the data that's in the model. They're clustered right around that one-to-one -one line. They even extrapolate beyond where the model is. And so, you know, this is a diluted bitumen sample. So we're looking at Enbridge type specifications, 70, 75 KPA. Um, our typical has been plus or minus two KPA or better. I'm going to show you some actual raw numbers on the sec let's, next uh, slide. We've got some great linear range. We cover a wide range of, uh, of vapor pressures. You know, their control that they're trying to get is right in around here. So you can see that's where most of our data is. And what they're trying to do here now, again, for those of you who aren't familiar with the application, you know, what they're trying to do here now is they have this bitumen sample 
they have to add condensate to it to get the viscosity down so it can flow. There's also a vapor pressure specification though. So they can add butane, which is a lot cheaper. And so what they wanna be able to do is see, are we, are we still meeting our vapor pressure specification as we change some of the diluents that we use? So if you look, you know, I said plus or minus two KPA, that was about the worst data point that we saw in the, some of the test samples. So these are a bunch of test samples that were pulled over the space of three days, different operating conditions. And you see we have the prediction value and the lab value. And those are often better than one KPA. Most of the samples are within one KPA. We have one that's sitting out there around plus two and one that's sitting out there around minus two. But most of them are one KPA or better. So what we feel this installation has demonstrated is that we can install and implement this technology quickly on a diluted bitumen application. Um, that the JP3 laser spectrometer brings some unique capabilities to this because of the spectral purity, the fact it's a laser, because it's really bright, and because we can make high resolution measurements, we can get a lot of spectral data. If we bring that into these advanced chemometric models, it lets us do real-time analysis of the vapor pressure, in this case, for bitumens. We think this has proven that we can measure VPCR4. We have some preliminary data on viscosity. We weren't doing lab viscosities at the time. We have some preliminary data on viscosity, and we're going to continue doing some work with this client to see if we can also incorporate a viscosity measurement in there. It wasn't part of the original purchase, but we'd like to see if it's another thing that we can uh, do. It's been running out there for you know, the better part of a month now with a model in it with virtually zero maintenance. We've been out there to uh, add some additional data communication features. Um, we've been out there to um, pull some additional samples but we really haven't had to do maintenance on the analyzer at all. So that kind of wraps up most of what I wanted to get at today. Um, we have an install base with this technology between the US and Canada. You know, JP3 themselves are at Austin, Texas. And so, you know, the big installed base has been in the, a couple of those Texas basins, you know, especially in the Permian. But you can see we've got installs right across most major fields in North America. In the Marcellus, the Haynesville, the Bakken, of course, up here, um, and, you know, in a big install base for us, it's hard to tell, but there's about 20 installations sitting up in this Montney region. And there's probably about 10 of them sitting over here around Edmonton. Um, we've got a good mix of applications between crude oils, condensates, NGLs, natural gas applications. In the US, they do a lot of refined fuels. Transmix and pipeline is another big application for this that we haven't even scratched yet in Canada, but we can put this technology on and look at what products are moving down a pipeline in real time and say, you're on spec for jet right now. You're off spec for jet because there's some gasoline blended into it. Now you're on spec for you know, unleaded gasoline or um, for other products. Um, we've got over 30 installations now up in Canada, probably over 40 measurement points because some of the analyzers. Um, so we've got a good install base. We've proven this in a number of applications. We've got about five of them in Canada. They're doing crude oil blending. This is, like I say, our first dill bit one. You know, inside analytical, we work with a number of different partners. I saw something come up in the chat. Raw bistrum and viscometer, uh, yeah. <sighs> Do you used to know this guys. We've done some work with Imperial to try to look at raw bitumen. And raw bitumen, you know, without that condensate in there, it is so opaque and thick. It becomes pretty difficult to do. High water cuts, high gas volume fractions, can make a lot of the sampling tough. I know when you're looking at solvent-assisted SAG-D, or that's where we started to try to look at this at is, you know, 
looking at solvent assisted SAG D. And we're pretty convinced we can do in the solvent assisted SAG D application. There's two kinds of streams that are common. One is the, the liquid stream that's coming back, if you like, you know, that has the bitumen, some solvent in it, and of course, what high water cut. And the second is the gas phase stream and, and people wondering what, how much of the solvent am I losing to the steam? The steam measurement seems more likely at this point from what we've seen when you have bitumen coming back that doesn't have very much condi in it. The opacity, the just gets so high, it's still tough to get the laser through. We got reasonable results by shortening the cell length. Um, and you know, certainly at high temperatures, we don't have to worry as much about the viscosity issues that having a smaller cell creates, but we haven't done uh, the raw bitumen. But yeah, if you do the raw bitumen viscosity um, and figure out how much solvent's coming back with it, another game-changing application. It's one we're looking at, Mark, but it's not certainly not mainstream yet. We kind of feel this vapor pressure of diluted bitumen is, is mainstream now. From a products, you know, this gives you an idea of the product lines that we work with. Thanks, Mark, appreciate that. Um, kind of gives you an idea of the product lines that we work with. You know, JP3 is certainly, J, JP3 is inside analytical's raison d'etre. I had been doing consulting work with them back in uh, you know, 2013 as they were developing the product. And as I saw that product coming together, began speaking with them about how they were gonna sell it up in Canada. And you know, Inside Analytical really got founded to help develop that market for JP3. We saw it as being a potentially game-changing technology, especially on the condensate stabilization side of things. Uh, as the Montney shales were getting developed, and we wanted to be the guys who helped bring this technology to Canada. So it started Insight, really. It's why I started Insight. And as we've done it, we've brought on other technologies that augment our measurement capabilities. Um, you see UWT in there for level measurement and Ragaku there for total sulfur measurement in bigger fonts, just because there are some of the newest things that we're kind of bringing into the fold of how we try to help our customers do better measurements in the field. You know, if those of you aren't aware about it, we have a YouTube channel. We've talked about a lot of these technologies and have, uh, you know, you'll be getting a link to the YouTube to this presentation as well. Um, we put all of these presentations up on YouTube and make them available to our customers so, or potential customers. So. If you're trying to find out more of the technology, you can look at it. Um, you can see we've got a fairly wide ranging product line. Some exciting things that are likely going to happen in the new year. So we're looking forward to continuing to do these and tell you what's going on. Um, so what's next? You know, if you've got questions about an application, contact us. We've got multiple applications in place. We're happy to give you, uh, uh, in many cases, references to customers that you can talk to who are using this technology in the field. We see applications right across the hydrocarbon processing industry from gas phase applications to NGLs like Condi and C3 plus streams, uh, crude oil applications, obviously, and crude oil blending. Uh, now we would add Dilbit in with that as well. And of course, on the refined fuel side as well. And again, you know, we like to do our systems integration. I love showing this picture. It's one of the projects that was done with a client. We build our own composite samplers. So we've got two composite samplers sitting in the system. One of the things you can have problems with uh, in some of these applications is wax buildup and things like that. We've got an automated solvent flush system to protect against waxing off of the samples. PLC system to do automated grab sampling over here. And I cut the picture off, unfortunately, but there's a JP3 cell sitting right over here. All of this is inside of a big metering building.
If you're looking to get more information, you can contact, uh, you can either visit our website, insideanalytical.com, or uh, Scotty is on the call here. So, you know, Scotty is always happy to take a phone call or an email or myself. Um, and we're happy to get you more information about applications. And that, I believe, wraps me up, I think, if I look at my phone, right on time at one o'clock. Killed it. Um, any questions, happy to address them. Good questions, Brian. So no, as we discussed earlier on this one, you know, it was a new application for us. So thanks, Joe. Good seeing you, man. Um, as we discussed in this one, it was a new application. And so we didn't want to, we hadn't, we'd done some lab measurements to get spectra of diluted bitumens, but we hadn't done anything in the field and online. And so when we were talking to a customer who was saying they're willing to purchase one, we wanted to make sure we established some pretty realistic goals. And so we said, we're going to take, we're going to give you a six month, or we'd like you to give us a six month time frame to, you know, frankly, to put it crudely, to get our shit together and, and figure out any problems that might come up in trying to do this measurement. But no, we've, uh, when we're doing Condi applications, um, sort of gas plants and things like that, it's usually a pretty quick model build. JP3, well, you know, I didn't talk about some of the unique things about what JP3 has done, but there's a cellular modem in all these analyzers. We build up spectral data from all the installations. And so when we do a new install, say on a condensate stabilizer, one of the things we can do is look in the library of data that we have and say, geez, their Condi looks a lot like Condi from this other plant. We could possibly use that other plant, some of the data from that other plant to build a preliminary model and then just add more data in to refine that model and make it more site specific. Generally speaking, I would say the analyzer results get better and better over that six month interval if we add more calibration data in. But we can get our initial model up and running pretty quick, typically. And yeah, a single unit's able to load and calibrate multiple models. So when JP3 is looking at some of these applications like um, transmixing pipelines, we may have a pipeline that goes from moving, you know, Y grade sort of LPG to a refined butane product to a condensate. And they'll look at telling you both when or how the transmix is and give data about the chemical composition of each of those things. So we have, um, and when we put a multi-stream unit in, and one of the things I didn't mention, but if we put a multi, like a four, one, a unit that's able to uh, uh, have up to four different flow cells, each of the flow cells is running, can be running a completely different model as well. So one flow cell might be on a DF, one might be on a condensate stabilizer, one might be on a debutanizer, another one might be on a gas phase stream. So we, and so when you talk about doing different products, or J, you know, and Nate's on, Um, and so you can talk about some of the things they've done with model switching down there, where we've had, you know, even when we were doing some of the crude applications, we started to look at, well, should we run a different model for light sweet than we run for heavy sour? So, yes, if you, Mark's got a question there about if a company allowed JP3 access to sample data. So, if you have a local lab, and so you're using your local lab to generate results, and you've got the JP3 installed. We just need a way, and we implement that in all our systems, usually with a, um, a local switch that basically says, I'm going to push this switch, which is going to tell the JP3 analyzer, I'm pulling a lab sample right now. 
And there's a little bit of dialogue that goes on between the JP3 and the switch. It actually says, I'd like to pull a sample now. The JP3 says, okay, I got the spectrometer all ready for you to pull a sample now. And then you say, now I'm pulling the sample and pull your lab sample. That data, we've had clients who do their own sampling in their own labs and send that data into JP3 and JP3 builds the model. From Cody, once calibrated, how much variance in fluid properties would it take before you'd consider calibrating again? Thinking specifically in the heavy crude bitumen. Um, again, you know, we're kind of, it's kind of new what we usually say. And so what we do is we like to say, look, we're gonna come out and pull a bunch of samples until we get you a model that's working good. Good usually being, we like to say, the spec we like to give because the, the reference method D6377 um, says it only has a, a repeatability of about, I can't remember the number off the top of my head, about 3 kPa, 3.3, I think. Um, so we like to say, look, we're gonna get you within three and a half or four kPa to lab, depending on whose lab you're using. And so that'll be a preliminary model and it's ended up and running. Once we've got sort of satisfaction and agreement that we're all happy with the model, we will implement, we can implement what we refer to as kind of like a performance program where we say, look, we're gonna come up quarterly and pull some additional samples, tell you how you're doing compared to your existing model. And if the data has changed this, so Thing that adding those samples into your model would help, then we can add those samples into the model. So that's why I usually tell people, usually the analyzer gets, if people put in that performance modeling package, you know, where they'll say, we'll have you come out, add some extra data every quarter. It allows us to tighten that model up more and more over time. So I wouldn't refer to it as recalibrating again, as much as augmenting the existing calibration. Unless you actually thought, like I, we've actually switched to a different product. We've gone from being a, a bitumen type crude to let's say synthetic crude or a conventional heavy. Then it might be like, it's better off just building a whole new model again and possibly doing model switching. No worries, thanks for the question. Again, we're always grateful and thankful for people to come out. Um, you know, we, uh, uh, we as a company uh, like to support, service and support our clients, um, um, boast a little bit, and we like to service and support our community too. We have a policy that every purchase order we get, we take a percentage of that purchase order and donate it to charities. So Scotty has just had the pleasure of being up in Grand Prairie, where we had a couple of recent installations and we made a pretty sizable contribution over to the kids sport up in Grand Prairie. Um, if you're you know, a remote company, we try to, if you're up from someplace like GP or Fort St. John, we usually talk to you about what charities you like up there. Can we support somebody that you guys are already working with? So um, thanks, Mark. Good seeing you, man, always. We should get out for a beer when I'm back in town. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's something we do and I think it's, Try to build a sense of community in the company and with our clients and amongst our staff. I think it's good for good for people in general. If there aren't any other questions, uh, I think I'm gonna let you guys go. Well, there was a quick question about ballpark costs for one of these systems, but I'm assuming we don't talk money and Scott might contact him. Oh, was there one? Was that good to yeah. direct to you? No, it was it was from to everyone just before Mark's. Said he must go. Oh, did, it, did I miss it? Okay. Maybe. From Brian Donovan. I thought I ignored it. <laughs> um, I don't see, I don't think, well, if I see it. I, um, I'm, I'm okay with talking costs. I mean, we typically look at, by the time you're all done, installed, modeled, um, Canadian with a full sample system, uh, you're probably in the 200 to 250,000. 
Um, for a single stream system doing a vapor pressure type application, you're probably going to be in that 200, 250 kind of range. Or actually, that was with the multi stream. No, that's with a single stream analyzer. If it's a multi stream analyzer, it's going to be a little bit more, but you can add on additional streams for um, lower price. You know, it's, it's incremental cost. Adding the second, third, and fourth stream are incrementally not as much. So that's. Again, that's all in, that's analyzer, field installation, pulling the samples to build the model, paying for the lab work to build the model, um, support in that first year, et cetera, so. But Scott, you certainly, you know, we happy to, uh, Again, we've done enough of these now that when we do a budgetary quote, we usually give you a, a full drawing package that sort of says, this is kind of what a typical drawing package is going to be like. So if you've got engineering you want to consider, you know, we can help you through all that part too. Cool. Well, if there's nothing else, thanks very much, everybody, for coming. Uh, keep an eye out. We continually do these things and be happy to have you guys come on board for another presentation soon. I think our next one is going to be UWT um, and talking about some level measurements. Is that right, Scotty? Jaden? Uh, yep, that'll be October 28th. Cool. Awesome. That's one where I don't have to speak at except to make a guest appearance, maybe. That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Brian. Have a great day, guys. Thank you, Phil. Uh, no worries. Thank you, Neil. Take care, everybody.